the M113 is a vehicle people talk about a lot. And it makes sense, right? It's one of the most prolific vehicles ever made. But what I don't get is how intense and polarized the discussion is around it. A lot of people seem to think that the M113 is just irredeemable garbage. But you also have people like Mike Sparks. I mean, Mike Sparks thinks it can do anything. Even fly. Sure, you have to ignore that it has the aerodynamic qualities of a brick, but I think that's an area Mike is pretty familiar with. Now, despite that, I'm actually sort of on his side. Now, before you destroy me in the comments, I'm not saying that the M113 is perfect and that we should keep using it. My stance is that, by and large, I think it gets a bad rap. I mean, it is basically just an aluminum box, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, and I'll try to explain why. Now, we actually have to go all the way back to World War II. The concept of the armored personnel carrier didn't just appear out of nowhere. During the war, the army tended to use half-tracks to transport its troops, and these had a few issues. Their main flaw was that once they went off-road, they couldn't keep up with tanks. I know that some people think that the track in the back makes half-tracks equal in mobility to tanks, but that's not the case. It helps out, but they still lag behind. Anyway, they did make fully-tracked carriers to try and fix this, like for example the Bren Universal Carrier, or the M39 Armored Utility Vehicle, which was based on the M18 Hellcat. Now these were much better options. Not only could they keep up with tanks, but they could also carry and move more. The M39 was used pretty extensively in the Korean War, but it was still less than ideal for a few reasons. Firstly, it had no overhead protection, meaning that if you were sitting inside of it and airburst artillery went off over your head, you were basically cooked. It also wasn't extremely resistant to small arms fire, meaning rifle caliber rounds. Now, it was only vulnerable at close range and probably with armor-piercing ammunition, but it's still pretty concerning if your vehicle can't stop the most common weapon on the battlefield. So again, the army wanted to find a solution. This led to the T-16, also based on the M-18. It could carry a whopping 24 men, and had a crew of three. The commander was situated behind the engine compartment, which was in the middle front of the vehicle. The driver and assistant driver were on either side of the engine. Strangely enough, the commander didn't have a gun for himself, but there were two pintle-mounted machine guns, which the occupants could use if they felt like it. Now, as you can probably imagine, this vehicle was very large. Arguably way too large. In fact, I would say it's absolutely cavernous. Like, this doesn't look like an APC, it looks like a small home. I honestly wouldn't even be surprised if it had a kitchenette, and a toilet to boot. Well, at least you can carry a lot of men, right? There's never too much of a good thing. That's also not true. Having so many men made organization an absolute nightmare. And not only that, if the vehicle is hit catastrophically, you can lose 27 men to one hit. And as I like to say, this is suboptimal. Thankfully, there was a somewhat parallel development, the T-18. But it's a fairly strange and complex vehicle in its own right. In my opinion, it looks like a bit of a Hawaiian roll. It had a crew of five, a driver, assistant driver, commander, and two gunners. Each gunner had a remote turret on top. It carried 9 dismounts in total, so much better than the T-16. But despite removing the assistant driver and the turrets, it was still way too expensive, so it wasn't produced in large numbers. Yet another attempt was made, T-59E1, but hopefully based on how it looks, you can see we are finally getting close to the M113. This one was also fairly odd. It doesn't look like it from the outside, but if you look inside, you can see there's apparently no engine. Well, it didn't have an engine, it actually had two. It had two engines located in the sponsons. The vehicle was generally well liked, but it was pretty underpowered. The power pack was also pretty expensive. Now it did enter service as the M59, and did see use in Vietnam, but it wasn't produced very much at all. About 6,000 were made. Finally in 1957, a requirement for a new APC was drawn up. Compared to previous entries, it needed to be less expensive and have better armor. Two vehicles were drawn up by FMC, who made the two previous vehicles. Both entries would use aluminum for their construction. This was a pretty novel approach for the time. During World War II in Korea, aluminum was too expensive to use for ground vehicles, and aircraft got priority anyway. This changed in the late 50s though, as the price plummeted, so it was now viable for armored fighting vehicles. Now, aluminum actually isn't terrible for armor. Obviously, it's not going to be stopping tank rounds, but for small arms fire, it's pretty good, and the weight savings are definitely worth it. The two vehicles would be basically identical, but one would be lighter and air-deployable, while the other would be heavier and not. These were called the T-113E1 and T-113E2 respectively. They were both powered by the Chrysler 75M, a gasoline engine that produced 215 horsepower. They would be protected against rifle fire and shrapnel. They would also have a crew of two, a driver to the left of the engine and the commander behind it. There were 11 dismounts in total, and they were seated facing each other. The commander had a cupola with a pencil mounted 30 cal, but they would eventually change this to a 50 cal, which was probably a smart move. At least then if it came up against a light vehicle, it could defend itself. 
Unfortunately for the commander, he had essentially no protection. All he had was the cupola's hatch, which kinda sorta protected him from the rear, but not really. There was a hatch in the roof for the dismounts, so they could theoretically stand up and fire their weapons. For dismounting from the vehicle, there is a hydraulically operated door in the rear. And of course it wouldn't be great if the door got stuck while the vehicle was, say, on fire, so there was a manually operated door as well. It was a fairly speedy vehicle. It could manage 40 miles per hour on road, or about 64 kilometers per hour. It was also amphibious, and could travel 3 miles per hour while swimming. It didn't require any preparation to swim, which for the time was a pretty novel concept. Its maximum range was 200 miles, or about 321 kilometers. After some trials and testing, it was found that if it could drop a bit of weight, the T-113E2 could meet both requirements. The vehicle was already pretty bare bones as it was, so they had to shave down some armor. They did this by reducing the armor on the whole floor. In 1960, it entered production as the M113. Fully loaded for combat, it weighed a bit more than 10 metric tons. If they wanted to airdrop the vehicle, they had to use a reduced load, so less fuel and ammo. In 1964, it was upgraded to the M113A1. This replaced the Chrysler engine with the Detroit Diesel 6V53, which increased performance in all areas. It also made it a bit safer since it's diesel instead of gasoline. The biggest benefit to this upgrade was range. It could now travel 300 miles, or 482 kilometers. It was made just in time for the ground war in Vietnam to kick off. From what I can gather, this is probably where the M113's poor reputation comes from. You hear about troops hating it so much they would rather ride on top of it. I mean, this is pretty understandable, right? On the inside, it's all dark, it's cramped, nobody in your squad is showered for two weeks, and worst of all, you can't see outside. If you can see what's going on around you, you feel like you have more power to preserve yourself. If you're locked inside of a metal box, you are basically in the crew's hands. While riding on top of it is attributed to a fear of mines, it was likely caused by something else. You see, South Vietnamese troops didn't really use the M113 like an APC. They used it more like an IFV. They would ride on top of the vehicle and engage the enemy from there. This might sound kind of stupid on the surface, but there's actually a pretty good reason for it. When an M113 had to come to a stop and let the infantry dismount, the attack lost momentum. Eventually, US troops adopted this approach as well, and it proved to be fairly effective. But as you can imagine, they were still very vulnerable. So the concept of the Armored Cavalry Assault Vehicle, or ACAV, was developed to aid in this approach. Most importantly, it gave the commander all-round protection. Shielded weapon stations were also added to the back. These usually mounted the M60 light machine gun, but troops also mounted recoilless rifles, automatic grenade launchers, and even miniguns. Just about anything they could get their hands on. Given this in the Grim Reaper M48 Patton, I think that Vietnam was a kleptomaniac's dream. A large number of M113s were destroyed, but the vehicle wasn't really at fault. The environment not only made it difficult to move tracked vehicles, it made their movements predictable. So it was pretty easy for the Viet Cong to successfully plant an anti-tank mine. The dense vegetation also made it easy to ambush with anti-tank weapons, which you would think they wouldn't have a ton of, but it's true. Two weapons were the most common, 57mm recoilless rifles and RPGs. Out of all the weapons though, mines were probably the most abundant and effective. Vietnam taught the US a lot of valuable lessons, so they tried to make upgrades reflecting that experience. The post-war M113A2 saw a lot of additions. These include a new transmission, the X200 from Allison, upgrading the engine to the 6V53T, producing 275 horsepower, it now had neutral steering, a new suspension that increased off-road mobility, external fuel tanks, and smoke grenade launchers. This was followed by the M113A3, which was mostly a survivability upgrade. To give additional protection against mines, steel armor was added to the floor. Spall liners were also added to the interior. The P900 applique armor kit was also offered, but the army declined. If they had accepted it, it would have made it essentially immune to HMGs. Experience in Vietnam showed that the M113 wasn't amazing as a troop carrier, the armor could stand to be improved, troops couldn't fire while buttoned up, and the armament was insufficient. These would inform the design of the Bradley fighting vehicle, but the M113 had uses beyond being just a troop carrier. It was an amazing support platform. It was used as a cargo hauler, a bridge layer, an engineering vehicle, a command vehicle, a mortar carrier, an ambulance, a tank destroyer, a flamethrower, a self-propelled anti-air gun, and even a recon vehicle. It's been used by an incredibly wide range of countries, with many making their own variants to suit their needs. For example, the M113CV. This is basically an M113 that was cut in half vertically, shortened, and made into a full recon vehicle. The M113 is still very widely used, and generally well liked. It's not known exactly how many were made, but around 80,000 were built in total, by both the US and Italy. Now it may lack armor now, but when it was made it was pretty much average. 
I mean, compare it to, say, the BMP-1, the base BMP-1. The BMP-1 wasn't immune to HMGs. It was only fully protected against rifle caliber rounds. The same could be said for the M113. And for a multi-purpose platform like this, you don't really need more than rifle caliber protection. As a troop carrier, sure, but not really for, say, a command vehicle or a cargo hauler. You don't need amazing armor. It's nice to have, but what you need is something versatile and reliable, which the M113 is. Also, people tend to think the M113 is sluggish, which isn't entirely true, and I have a feeling I know where this comes from. In Operation Desert Storm, it was noted that A2s were too sluggish to keep up with units, but the A3 didn't have this problem, so it's sort of a half-truth. It depends on the time frame and vehicle you're looking at. You'd be surprised how speedy the A3 is, and when you compare it to its counterpart, the MTLB, they're pretty much equal but the M113 is a decade older. I guess you could count the BTR-50, but it wasn't very multi-role, at least not in the same way. Now as good as it was, it's a bit long in the tooth. Luckily, Amp V is in production. If you don't know what that is, it's basically a turretless Bradley. Well, not exactly, but it's a very simplified way of looking at it. It's replacing the M113. Now, should this have happened sooner? Possibly. But that doesn't make the M113 bad. The M113 is still viable for a few roles. It's just not the best option. It's just a rugged, reliable, and versatile box. And that's okay. Let me know what you guys think, or if you have suggestions for video topics, and I'll see you on the next one.